happy Pride Month. And happy month of National HIV Testing Awareness Day. And this pre presentation, welcome to the presentation of dating, relationships, and sex on the autism spectrum. I'm Kayla Rodriguez. I'm Eddie Dale. I'm Damon Neighbors. I'm Marenna K. Giwa Onaiwu. And Spencer Norris, who helped contribute, contribute to this presentation. Um, so this presentation is being pre co-presented by the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. And we've also listed a few other affiliations here. Um, and so one um, affiliation is the, um, the Rice Humanities Division Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. And Hanks, to HIV AIDS Network Coordination. So the learning objectives for today's presentation is access the many meanings of the term spectrum, discuss gender, identity, expression, et cetera, and sexuality, identify important dating and relationship barriers, describe factors related to intersectional identities and HIV, and share relevant trends, events, and resources. So like I said, I'm Kayla Rodriguez. I, I'm a Puerto Rican autistic lesbian. After high school, I learned advocacy in the Bobby Dodd Institute Ambassador Program, the GA LEN, and the My Voice, My Participation Program. I won the Golden Gold Gold Award for Young Community Advocate and the Bobby Dodd Institute Empowers Luminaries Award. I just got it this year. Hi, uh, I'm Damon, they, he, and I am someone who for the past four years has been writing, speaking, and educating about neurodiversity, gender, sexuality, dating, and addiction on the autism spectrum. Uh, I'm autistic, ADHD, queer, and transmasculine, and I have a couple of cats. Hi, I'm Eddie D. Gibbons. I'm a seasoned advocate and consultant currently residing in Texas. I discovered I had a neurodivergent ADHD. I found this out in my adulthood. After a lengthy and successful career as one of the few openly Black gay males uh, at the time in the South, I was visible in leadership roles in corporate America. I later switched gears and I became, I decided to follow my heart. So I serve the community. I have worked extensively in HIV prevention, treatment, and the allocation of services and funding. I'm a member of the Legacy Project of the NIH funded HIV AIDS Network Coordinating Center. And I'm also a member of the Houston Heart Network Cross Network Community Advisory Board. Hi everyone, I'm Marena Kay. Um, and on the screen, there's an image of me. Um, I'm a dark skinned female appearing um, black individual smiling at the camera. My hair is shoulder length and straight in that picture, but my hair is usually shoulder length and in locks. Um, my pronouns are she and they, and I'm a global advocate and, and an educator. Um, I'm twice exceptional. So my diagnoses um, you know, include um, being autistic, um, giftedness, ADHD. Um, I identify as a non-binary woman um, and I am black. I am from an immigrant family. Um, I have a biological and adoptive children from various countries. So we're a neurodiverse, zero different multicultural family. And we are currently living in the US South, specifically in Texas. I'm currently working as a humanities scholar for Rice University's um, Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and sexuality. I'm also co-chair of the Women's HIV Research Collaborative and enrolled in a doctoral program. As a consultant, I work with a number of different organizations. Um, currently, I'm consulting with the University of South Florida with um, the Color of Autism, Autism Self-Advocacy Network, Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, and with the University of Houston of uh, Sugarland. Miranda Kate did such a great job of image description. I think we should all, the rest of the three of us should have an image description. So this is Kayla speaking. Uh, I forgot to say my pronouns, she, they, and I also have ADHD as well. Um, I am a light skin, a lighter skinned Latinx woman. I have black and purple hair up to my shoulders. I'm wearing a black and white, like, um, crisp cross shirt. And my background is plain with the door and a beige wall. And I'll describe what I look like. I'm Damon Neighbors and I'm a white Jewish person who uh, has short hair like a fella, some red glasses, and a Jurassic Park shirt on. My description, my pronouns, he, him, 
I'm a cisgendered male. I'm a black male and I proudly, as I said earlier, I'm seasoned, meaning that I am well into 60s. Okay. And doesn't look a day over 30. Mm, I agree with that. Okay, then. So this is Kayla speaking. Now, I do have to give credit to Spencer Norris, who helped co-create the original version of this presentation. Spencer, I know you're not here with us, but I just want to say thank you for helping me create this original presentation. I couldn't have done it without you. So before we continue, um, we're just going to all give a little um, description of what we identify as a spectrum. So for me, my perspective, spectrum is just like, I don't think it really relates to there's one end and the other end. Um, and there's kind of like a whole range of things in that. I mean, before I used to think like there's one extreme and, and, and one, one end and the other extreme on the other, but, but there's just so many things in between. And, um, you know, it's just, maybe there is no end. There are no ends. Maybe the spectrum isn't a line. It's a circle or something. Um, because so many people and so many identities and, and so other things fit into that spectrum. So that's what I think. It's just a ra range of different, not differences, but I think identities and sexualities and race and neurodivergence and mental illness. It's just like a lot of different things. I'm gonna jump in. This is Marina Kay. And I really like what you said. And it kind of makes me, I like to script. So I'm thinking of this one very problematic movie, but I, I, I like stuff that's corny sometimes where there's a character who says, it's not a triangle, it's a circle. It keeps mm -hmm. going, it's a circle. And so I'm thinking about how you mentioned the spectrum being not just being, you know, on opposite ends of something, but being something that really kind of merges and kind of, you know, bleeds into one another. Like if you think about, you know, the lines of where an ocean and, a, you know, and maybe a lake, you know, reach, where, where does it stop being ocean water and stop being lake water? With the very first time I ever heard the word spectrum was as a child in elementary school and we learned about the color wheel and color spectrums. And there really isn't a distinctive place where this color stops being this color. They're so you know interwoven with one another. And so when I just think about different aspects of my identity, being a black person um, and being raised in the United States and being very proud of the black um, community here, but also being um, that my family is from West Africa. So that aspect of who I am. Um, growing up in a home where there were dual religions, um, thinking about myself, how I, you know, I was assigned female at birth. And so for a very long time, I considered myself cisgender. And when I started knowing more about gender, considering myself a non-binary person, but also a woman, because the identity of, of womanhood is something that's still important to me. Thinking about, um, and Eddie may talk about this some more, we, we do a lot of work in HIV research and how there's these people think about, um, don't understand that there's um, you know, in terms of viral load and um, elite controllers and long-term survivors and newly diagnosed that there's not just um, any one particular type. People used to call it quote unquote full blown AIDS or, you know, now we've got people who are undetectable. You know, it's just a range of things, gender, all of these things are just such a spectrum. They're not, you know, there's no such thing as high functioning and low functioning because that's kind of ridiculous. It's not linear. And so those are my thoughts on spectrum. I would just like to add that um, when you're looking at a spectrum, whether it's gender or um, uh, a disease spectrum or the autism spectrum, you are looking at different parts of it that are slightly different, but you wouldn't say something like blue is more spectrum than red. They're both on the spectrum. You wouldn't say... Um, I don't know, uh, a lesbian woman is more queer than a gay man. They're both queer, you know? It's just different parts, uh, different colors on the spectrum. And riding off that, I think capitalizing what everyone said is the beauty of it is having a red and a blue will give us violent, uh, a, a, a yellow, and a blue will give us green. These things are so unique that in this, this world we call the spectrum is what makes each of us, one of us so unique. And if we could tap into that as any individual, just every single individual could 
tap into the fact that on this thing we call a spectrum, which I totally agree with Kayla, that there is no ending. It's it's a circle. It's 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 just continuous. And in that circle, you have a circle within a circle. And all of us fall at different parameters within that circle, which makes us uniquely us, make us uniquely an individual. And I wish that all of us as human beings could tap into that mindset. And I think it will create a, a, a straighter path to finding out who you really are. So sex assigned at birth does not always equal how a person express and identifies or and expresses, nor does it determine attraction and sexuality. So this image here perfectly cap encapsulate that, um, you know, it describes that. So you have the sex designed at birth on the left, what the medical community labels you. And then on the right, this is the left, bottom left, the bottom right says gender expression how you want to display your gender. So if you're like, uh, oh, sorry, hold on. Um, so if you're like masculine or like, you, if you wanna be masculine, you, you wear masculine clothing. If you're feminine, you wanna wear feminine clothing or makeup or stuff like that. Um, in the middle here is gender identity, how you identify, um, you could identify how you see yourself, you know, how, how you identify how you see yourself. So. Basically, you know, there's not just a male or a female, there are multiple gender identities. Uh, there's including non-binary. And you could have more, you have multiple gender identities. So for me and Marina K, for example, and Damon, you know, I, we, me and Marina K are she, they, Damon is they, he. So you could be multiple. Um, it's not just confined to one gender. And then at the top of this triangle, is gender attribution, how your gender is perceived by others. So if you dress masculine, some might think, oh, that already makes you like a man, when it's not really that true. It's not that simple. Uh, or if you dress like a feminine, you're automatically like a girl, and that's also not entirely true. So these are the gender terminologies. Um, next slide. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of the gender-bred person, but basically it's really helpful because um, it helps showed what happened in the previous slide that in your brain, this is what makes you contributes to gender identity. Um, whether, you know, there's one of its womanness, one of its man manness, but as we just described, you know, spectrum isn't always those two extremes. Um, it could be a circle and it just be continuous and there's no like, they all bleed into each other. Um, your heart also, um, you know, it decides what romantic romantic attraction. So whether you're identity attracted to femininity or female or woman or male masculinity or man, or you just do non-binary or just androgynous or whatever, you know, whatever fits in the spectrum, you know, in the circle. And it's also it contributes to sexual identity, whether you attract or are attracted to like femininity, masculinity, male, female, woman or man, but again, or not binary or androgynous or just, well, you know, any gender, you know, that's where the heart is. And then your whole body basically um, is your gender expression. So whether you want to be feminine or masculine or in between or anything else, you know, that's what your body presents yourself as. And then the bottom part, which is where your bottom part is, um, is like feminine or mass, like either your feet, um, it basically determines your femaleness or man maleness, but it, it could also be like, it doesn't matter what you have down there, as long as what you identify what's in here, your, your, as long as you identify your gender from your brain it doesn't really matter what you have down there. Um, the, like we said, like your sex designed at birth does not determine what you identify with in the end. Um, each aspect of, of self, of yourself, you know, gender identity, romantic attraction, sexual attraction, gender expression, biological se sex exists on a spectrum. And autistic people exist 
at each part of each spectrum. So they, here we talk about the messages about autism. So what do neurotypical people expect from autism? So what is the image that comes to your mind when you think of autism? What does the media show you about autism? Well, I can take a guess for you. You probably are thinking, oh, the good doctor. Oh, Sheldon Cooper. Oh, these, all these white males who are geniuses at math and science and are asexual. When that's far from the truth. And people think that autism is just for children, that they'll grow out of it when they're, when they're, when they're an adult. And that is a disease or it's a disease only for boys. When that is entirely untrue, you do not grow out of autism. Autism is something that stays with you and is a part of you. It's not a disease that needs to be cured, prevented, or treated. It's part of who someone is. And so how does this affect, might affect dating and relationships? Well, the neurotypical people have expectations and stereotypes like, oh, this autistic, like autistic people like aren't gonna wanna be social and they don't wanna be have sex or be in a relationship. Oh, or they're gonna flap their arms or bang their head against the wall multiple times. So people should not have, shouldn't expect that we all fit into a stereotype of what neurodivergent people are, you know? Can I jump in, Kayla? Huh? Hold on a second, because I, I was just thinking about the examples you gave. And um, I, I'm really glad that you pointed that out because I think that we all, every human being, all four of us here, we're all neurodivergent people. We all, we're now we're all queer. There's all this other stuff going on that we have a lot in common, but we also have a lot of things different about ourselves. And the way a person might present at one point in their life or in one scenario is different. And so the stereotypes that people have um, kind of instead of it being a spectrum, they put, they almost are sort of like the terms like Kayla appropriately said, that are in a, that are ableist, high functioning and low functioning. The, the stereotypes are kind of high and low. Either you're this wonderful savant genius or mm -hmm. you're this individual that people perceive as subhuman. And however a person presents, if they appear to have high support needs or need, you know, or, or what have you, or present with some of the examples that Kayla was stating, they're still very much a person, still very much deserve respect, still may be very much wanting a, to date or be in a relationship. And so, um, you know, we just want to make it clear that some people try to say that, oh, there's, you know, this type of autism is almost like neurotypicality, almost normal, whereas this type Type, we look down upon. It's not, you know, it's problematic. It should be cured. And we, we denounce all of that. When Kayla mentioned that it's, a, it's um, a natural part of human neurology and it isn't something that needs to be cured or fixed, um, that's for however a person presents on the spectrum, however they, um, you know, they appear, however they, they speak or don't speak, however they act or don't act. So thank you so much, Kayla, for making that, such, that important point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Marina Kay. And also I would like to add that like, when they say like severe, that's also a no, no, no. You know, like that's just, that's really offensive, you know? And um, because like they're like severe aut aut autistic, you know, like that's kind of like degrading to them. And you know, ever again, we're talking about spectrum here. There's no from this end to this end, you know? So it's just like, I, I always tell people that food. severe and mild don't make sense. People aren't sauce. Yeah. So exactly. <laughs> people aren't like spices or whatever, or, you know what I mean? It's just who they are. And like, I just want to share from experience, like, you know, I was, when I was a young kid, I did not speak. I didn't speak till I was four. And my parents were like, oh, I'm so proud of you, Kaylee. You've gone, you've, you, you came so far, you know, like you got better. And like, that kind of offended me because it's like, I was fine to begin with. You know what I mean? Um, they, I guess they were saying I'm, I got, I was severe. And so I got better to a point where I'm like, you know, less severe. And that kind of offended me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the thing that we're talking about. So it happens, you know? Um, but yeah, basically, um, you know, people assume that autistics are, have, are asexual or they're strictly heterosexual, which I know from experience that is not true. Look at me. 
I'm gay. I'm very, I'm very, I'm, I do want to have sex in the future, you know, like it, and all of it, there's so many autistics with different sexualities and gender orientations. So, um, yeah, just, uh, keep that in mind that it's, and I've had a lot of people in my, in my personal experience say like, who unfriended me, like girls that unfriended me, because honestly, I think they have a stereotype in my head of, they have their stereotype in their head about what autism is and that we're asexual and all, all that different stuff or hetero. And they think autistics are always heterosexual, but that's not the case. And then there's also a lack of consideration and support for uh, adult topics and population. Like there's a lot of services that um, we, autistics receive as children and then they phase out when they, when they grow up. Um, me, I did another presentation with Spencer and we talked about like how disabled people aren't taught the right sex, sex, sex ed, sexual edu sex education and often it isn't accessible or they don't tend to talk, talk to autistic, I mean, autistic and disabled people about that because they assume either we don't wanna have sex or we can't have sex or we don't wanna be in relationships and can't be in a relationship and that's completely false. And like, you know, yeah, it's not educated and supported in sexuality and exploration. And a lot of these places don't even talk about LGBT. You know, schools don't usually, um, talk about like LGBT and different sexualities and different genders and this system's all messed up, but, and hopefully yeah. it'll improve and time goes on, but we need to include disabled people in the conversation and also LGBT um, people, different, you know, non-binary and different genders. And as we see, we'll see later in the presentation, HIV and AIDS education. So what do autistic people want from relationships? Well, we want hope. Hope we have. After, um, we want. We have hope for authenticity, kindness, interest, commitment, and trust. We want people who will not lie to us and not stop. But you know, not just have a one night stand and leave us. We want actual fulfilling relationships. At least that's what I want. I mean, again, like I said, every autistic person is different, but a lot of us including me, want a real relationship. And some are less interested in hookups and non-monogamy. Basically, non-monogamy is like poly, um, you know, like different, you know, like, you know, people dating multiple, someone dating multiple people. And while, I, while some autistics are into that stuff, some aren't, like, I'm not into that stuff. Like for me, you know, and others, you know, some are interested in marriage and long-term relationships and others are not. I'm interested in the former, um, but it's okay that others are not either. And relationships are hard to navigate, but it's worth it. It really is worth it. As long as you have a partner that isn't ableist and is willing to um, support you and, you know, obviously accepts you. And they want this, autistics and people with this, and uh, Autistics and disabled people want the same thing and that's neurotypical people in the end. You know, we, we, want, we want fulfilling relationships. We want, you know, to have sex and we want, you know, and some want hookups and that's fine. But we also want what every neurotypical people want to be happy with someone. So here on the, on the right side, in this visual, you can see the different types of sexualities. Obviously, there is, we all, all, we all know of straight and we all know of gay and lesbian and bisexuality, but there are also, also most, multiple sexualities. So for example, there is demisexu demisexual, which is sexual attraction only after an emotional connection is established. And one thing is you could identify as multiple sexualities. Like for example, I am demisexual in addition to being a lesbian. And then there's free sexual, which is sexual attraction to people that one is familiar with. And then many sexual, and I don't know how to say this one, co Q sexual. It's coy sexual, I believe. Coy sexual. Thank you, Damon. And fin sexual, gray sexual, polysexual, which is what I was talking about earlier about, you know, a lot of people, one person dating with multiple people. And then pansexual, which is sexual attraction to all genders and sexes or sexual attraction 
regardless of gender and sex. So then we are going to talk about the barriers queer autistic people face when dating. So like I talked about before, there's social expectations, expectations, assumptions, stereotypes, and ableism. There's an assumption of like of, gen- of sexuality, gender, ability, et cetera, to participate in relationships and sex. Like again, a lot of people think autistics are only heterosexual or they're asexual and they think we're gonna be, we're gonna be able to handle a relationship when it's, that's certainly not the case. And um, there's lack of social coaching services related to relationships and dating. You know, some autistic people don't know the cues or what to do in a relationship or what a relationship is like. So there's not a lot of, of social coaching services to help someone navigate a relationship. I know I need one. <laughs> um, so heavy reliance on social cues and nonverbal communication in the dating world makes it hard for autistics to be able to date because autistic people, we're not good at figurative language or like, you know, seeing in between like details and stuff. I mean, at least for me, I need something very literal and told outright. Like, I can't tell when like someone loves me until they actually say it. Um, And unfortunately with dating, you need the reliance on social cues and nonverbal communication and lots of reading in between the lines. There's a lack of understanding related to expectations in relationships and sex education and executive functioning as maintenance in relationship, like, um, you know, autistic people, maybe they don't like, I think, you know, I've never been in a relationship. So from my experience, like, I don't know what to expect. And I I, I don't have proper sex education myself because I don't want to watch porn. Um, I'm not not into that. So, but but where am I going to be educated on sex, you know? And there's also a lack of safe spaces or an awareness of safe spaces, space, safe spaces where people can meet in a more authentic and reliable safe setting. So what I mean by that, you know, I live in Atlanta. I mean, well, I live near Atlanta, Georgia, where there's a lot of, there's a huge gay community. However, there is a, a problem with that. I mean, there is a problem with, the thing is, is that a lot of gay people, one of, a lot, most of the meetups in the gay community are near bars, which have alcohol and are very loud. And for someone with noise sensitivity due to my autism, it, it's not fun. And I often go alone because I don't know who else to go with. And it's just a really, I don't fit in in a bar setting, you know? It's, but that's unfortunately a lot of gay meetups in Atlanta are based around bars. And that's how you mostly meet gay people most of the time is in bars and that's not helpful for me and I feel like left out. And yeah, again, that also ties into lack of extensive social groups and support networks of wing men and women who could act as social coaches and peers. Like it's only now recently I was able to meet some friends who could help me, neurotypical friends who could help me. But before I didn't have any of that. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to approach women. I awfully, when I, I tried to go to these bars, which I was already having a problem with because of the noise sensitivity. And I would just go to approach women by myself. And I was really scared and they didn't seem interested in me and they weren't, I never saw them again. So, and again, people, and so that leads into people's intentions are intangible and able to be seen. It's really difficult to identify another's needs. So I don't know if people are really into me or they're not. Um, I don't know what their real intentions are. It's hard for me to know if they really like me or they're just playing along. Like, it's difficult. It really is difficult. So me and Damon are going to speak about current dating trends. So one big thing for me, because I do not rely, it's hard for me on bars because it's hard for me to be in bars. And I feel like most of the gay community near me go to bars. I rely on online dating and I'm on multiple dating apps, I hate to admit, but the the reading intentions and social cues through online platforms is different. I mean, people can say something or type in something on a dating app, but you don't know what they really mean by that. And there's a lot of slang, general, generational terms, nuance that a lot of autistics can't pick up on. 
I can't. And then a lot of people, trust me, I've encountered so many people on dating apps that um, want to do new nudes, wants to send, want me to send them nudes, or they want me to hook up with them, or they uh, hook up with the, the, them and their boy boyfriend. And I'm like, oh God, please. I'm like, I can't do any of that stuff. You know, I'm not comfortable with it. But unfortunately, a lot of people on those apps want that. So it's really hard to find someone genuine. And if you do find someone that's not like that, they could ghost you, which ghosting means like they talk to you for a bit and then all of a sudden they stop talking to you and you never hear from them again. And then they also be catfishing, which basically is someone is pretending to be someone they're not, like using someone else's pictures, even though they don't look like that. And then um, do you want to speak, Damon? Yeah. Um, and going back to when we were talking about um, different kinds of relationships um, and sexualities, uh, some more current trends, although I think people have always wanted to do this, as uh, for instance, polyamory, where you have committed relationships with more than one person, or you have a different kind of uh, relationship with different people that meets different needs for you. And uh, this seems difficult and scandalous for a lot of people to think about, but it's actually very important to uh, the disability community to have that option. Um, for instance, if you can't provide everything for a person due to cognitive or physical issues that a person wants, or your partner can't meet all of your uh, needs, I agree about uh, there needs to be far more um, meeting places that are not full of uh, predators, drugs, alcohol, um, loud bands all the time lots of autistic people love to go to the club and dance and a lot don't um but being as we are queer and autistic we also have an extremely high rate of substance abuse and difficulty from that so it's really important to have you know dry spaces and uh, more supportive quiet spaces, gaming spaces, mm -hmm. um, lots of different ways that people can have community other than the, than our heavily alcohol culture. Yeah. Um, can I say and, something? Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't mean to like make people feel bad if they are polyamorous, like that's something you can totally do. And I didn't like Damon's right, you can, for some disabled people, that's a perfect option for, them, option for them. I'm just saying that some autistics, again, not all, every autistic is different, including myself. I do want a real, like one, one on monogamous relationship. Some autistics want that, I do too. And some autistics can't be in a bar, but also can't, some can, but those who can't be in the bar, they do, it. All, those bars aren't, sensory friendly, you know, they have loud noises. That's something I struggle with. And it's hard to initiate conversation, especially with strangers if you go by yourself. So again, it's like, you know, for some autistics, including myself, it's a struggle, but others it may not. So it depends. But I think obviously I think it should be more accessible, these these events. They don't even have a wheelchair ramp most of the time. It's just atrocious. But yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, I'm just gonna go over some of the barriers that we uh have to um there it is. Barriers to maintaining relationships. Uh, different communication styles are really common, even among other autistic people. We communicate differently from neurotypicals and also very differently from one another. So there can be misunderstandings. A lot of us have trauma, especially childhood trauma, and that leads to fear of abandonment, exclusion, and so you get upset when you start seeing the signs in a relationship that somebody might be pulling away and you freak out and it becomes a self-fulfilling pro prophecy. And that person's like, oh no, I can't deal with this person. And you scare people away. Happens a lot to me. We have conflicting needs, especially with cohabitation. Uh, some people need to be able to make loud noises or speak loudly or bang around the house. And some people cannot stand that sensory input. And there are many examples of how relationships don't work out, even though the people love each other, 
because of conflicting needs, especially if they're both neurodivergent. Um, we also suffer from poor self image. Uh, we didn't grow up seeing our identities represented. So it's, we don't have strong identities and we just don't have um, really good access to information uh, about queer relationships and trans health care and, and just literally just how to flirt and gay. I, I'm 43 years old and I just never learned how to flirt and gay because there weren't any good examples of it. Um, we also, and this goes for all people, but it's especially difficult for neurodivergent people is no experience setting and enforcing those boundaries and thinking because you are a different person and you're kind of at the bottom of the social totem pole that you just have to put up with what people give to you. Um, of course, with us, financial and housing is a lot more difficult to gain and maintain. There's discrimination on many levels for LGBTQ, HIV positive and disabled people. Um, there have been a lot of initiatives to help address that, but there's just clearly not enough affordable housing for us, especially if uh, because of our disabilities, we're depending on family that is not accepting of queer identities. Um, of course, we went over the fact that there's a lot of unspoken rules to dating and everybody's got different unspoken rules. Um, we also have trouble asking for help or even knowing where to look for it or find it. And then sometimes when you do get a counselor or help, they are just not informed about someone with multiple marginalizations and uh, how to relate to people of color, queer people, neurodivergent people. And when you're all those things, it becomes uh, almost impossible to get a therapist who can relate to you. Um, and again, I mentioned families, communities, and our, our governments, our local governments are really not being supportive of um, particularly trans people at the moment. We'll get into that later, but um, it's been really difficult. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so um, on a darker note, uh, these are some of the problems and consequences we face. Um, it's hard to find statistics about queer neurodivergent people because th uh, this particular population, that intersection has not been properly studied. It's getting better. Um, we have much more uh, minority stress and stigma. Um, autistic trans youth are plowing a tough row. They've got a hard time getting out into the world, being their authentic selves, getting proper medical care and getting a job or anything like that. Um, what, of course, even more misunderstood and underserved than straight or cis neurodivergence. Uh, double or triple the bullying, assault, isolation, family estrangement. Um, being autistic, we are especially sensitive to abuse and direct and uh, rejection. Uh, we retain trauma very easily and it messes up for a long time and it's harder to get over um, or past or heal from those things. And of course, uh, I'm, there's plenty of statistics out there, but none specifically about our poverty, homeless addiction and suicide rates. But looking at the suicide rates and addiction rates of autistic people and LGBTQ people, you have to understand that at the intersection of that, it's very high. And that's something we don't talk about quite enough. And next slide. And I just want to say, like, I'm one of those people who have been, you know, and in that intersection at that intersection, let's just say, of autistic and LGBT and, you know, being suicidal. And I just want to say that I'm part of that, too. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Story of my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, it's OK. Next slide. Yep. OK. Um, a lot of new studies are coming out about just how prevalent gender diversity or trans non-binariness is in neurodivergent populations. Um, in Holland, they found like 7.8% of children 
uh, referred to a clinic for gender identity disorder. Uh, were also identified as autistic. Um, another study reversed the method and looked at neurodivergent people for gender variants, and the rate was remarkably almost exactly the same. Um, you need to remember that in the general population, only about a little more than half a percent of people identify as trans or non-binary. So that is just a that's many times more than the than the general population, and there are a lot of reasons for that that I won't go into here. Um, but essentially, when you have a remarkably different neurology, um, our attraction, gender, and relationship styles are going to be different too. It's it's not more complicated than that. Uh, of course, not every autistic person is queer, not every queer person is neurodivergent, but I think we've established that there's a really powerful overlap there. Uh, and it needs uh, a lot of attention needs to be paid to that because we are among the most vulnerable people in society. Uh, you can go to the next one. And uh, another sad statistic, our assault rates are shockingly high. Um, there, one Canadian study, uh, it was 78% of those surveyed said they had been sexually assaulted autistic adults. Uh, a smaller but very good British study um, talked extensively to 14 late diagnosed women and asked them about their sexual experiences. And 64% um, reported serious problems in that area. Um, I want to point out that these statistics that I have here are for speaking autistics um, with no intellectual disability who are not in uh, group home or institutional facilities. An Australian study recently uh, showed that over 95 percent of developmentally disabled and intellectually disabled women are sexually assaulted over half of those more than 10 times. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult. And I wanna point out that uh, men and males are not immune from that either, especially if they're also queer. And uh, cause about a third of men on the spectrum are also, also sexually assaulted. Um, those are uh, things we have to remember. And you wanna say something, Kayla? Oh yeah, this is Kayla. Oh, this is my deaf name, by the way, for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that I fall into the statistic, like I'm autistic and I, I'm an autistic dog and I have been sexually assaulted. So you're not alone if you have. No, I mean, I certainly have, and uh, I'm not squeamish about talking about it because I think it's an extremely common experience Absolutely. Yeah, that same. we all Absolutely. have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, sure domestic know. violence rates are also a lot higher for us, too. Yeah. yeah, and I'm just saying, hopefully in the future, people will talk about it more. Maybe we'll lead the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next slide. Yep. Okay, and I'm going to let uh, Myrna Kay take over here and talk more about what it, what it, it means to live at multiply marginalized intersections. Sure. Um, thank you, Damon. You set everything up really well for me. Um, this, this whole presentation is just, I, I don't know, there's, there's, I, I feel like I almost wish we had split this into like a series because there's so much important information mm -hmm. to talk about. But um, so um, we've kind of been going from the micro to the macro. So um, Kayla gave an overview of, you know, so people could understand the difference between um, you know, sex assigned at birth and gender and give an overview of some of the different types of gender expressions and some of the different types of, of, of you know, sexualities that there are, are others, of course, but giving some common, you know, ones or some ones that are found frequently and sharing a lot of the, um, the nuances about how um, there are barriers and um, um, challenges with dating, with sex and so forth when in the autistic community. And then, um, and particularly when one is queer. And um, Damon has given, you know, very sobering, um, but probably um, underreported statistics yeah. from, you know, from what we can know about the, the difficult realities of these intersections of queerness, of neurodivergence 
you know, of um, poverty and all of these other things of, of, of gender identity. Um, and so we know that, um, you know, there's a, I have a saying sometimes that autism doesn't travel alone. Um, very, most autistic people have, more, you know, if it's if they're if it's not gender diversity, if it's not ADHD, if it's not <laughs> um, something, most of us have different types of you know tendencies to have um, you know multiple you know things going on in our lives. You know, intersectionality is a reality for us. And so I think one thing that a lot of people seem to forget about, as Kayla mentioned, a lot of people think heterosexual male, white, or child. Um, people often forget about the fact that, you know, autistic people and, and you know, people who are, are neurodivergent, neurodiverse can look in any kind of way. They can be from any type of background. They can and are <laughs> of, in, of, of any type of racial group, et cetera. And things become a little bit complicated when you add in that layer too. And they're already complicated <laughs> to begin with. But there are a lot of things in multi communities. So when you look at the, you know, historical and current, um, you know, aspects of a number of communities, if we're looking at, you know, people of the global minority, uh, majority, I'm sorry, people of color and so forth, there are, you know, there, and if you look at certain regions of the world, you can find that there are different views you know, sometimes very stigmatizing views about certain things about sexuality, certain things about, you know, gender and so forth. Um, certain things that are, that are expected, expectations of a person that are cultural that may differ from what um, is natural to that person according to their neurology and or their um, sexuality. And so these are all the things that are, aren't talked about a lot. Um, you know, a lot of the fact that, you know, we're gonna start in a moment, we're gonna talk about um, the intersection of HIV, and we're going to talk about that at length, but all of this connects um, because everything that we've talked about, all of these groups that have these multiple marginalizations that make them at higher risk um, for um, intimate partner violence and for sexual assault and for, um, you know, it, mental health and suicidal ideation. These are also the things that increase one's risk for, um, you know, and, one, and the prevalence of, um, you know, things such as HIV. And so these things um, are not talked about. Um, they are not explored. It, you know, people act like it's an, an anomaly and it isn't. It's a lot more of the reality um, for many of us than, um, than it appears currently. And um, before I go on to the other slide, um, Damon, were there some additional points that you wanted to make with regard to this? And with regard to what? To this, the queerness, disability and, and intersections in general. Uh, I did want to mention something uh, that's very difficult for the autistic trans community, and that is trying to access care. For instance, uh, if you are diagnosed autistic first, and then you come to your medical professionals and you're saying, well, I think I'm trans too. Um, I've heard so, so, and talked to so many trans people who are autistic who have been put off. They're like, no, you're just trying to fit into a trend, a group, you're confused, you don't know your own mind. Um, it's, you're just autistic, you know, and we're not gonna take your sexuality seriously. Now, if you're trans and uh, you're receiving therapy and care for being trans first, but then you begin to suspect your neurodivergence, um, that will, your difficulties will all often be dismissed as um, trauma related to being trans. And uh, they are very reluctant to even give you an evaluation for further neurodivergent conditions. So that's what we talk about when we say um, an intersection can be a double bind. Uh, it can be very difficult to navigate uh, to extremely misunderstood and um, uh, intersections like that. Oh, can I say something? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say like, you know, we already talked about how neurodiverse and autistic people can be, you know, people of color, you know, and like different sexualities. I do wanna also point out, you know, the ableism and racism and sexism in the LGBTQIA communities and as an important one, there's also homophobia, transphobia, racism, and sexism in disability communities. Right now, there's this whole 
thing going on. I don't know if you heard of Kayla Smith, but she left the autistic community recently because of racism. And I, that's something that must be so hard for her because, you know, she's in an intersection, she's not just autistic, but she's also a, a black woman. And so that is so difficult for her that our own community isn't, uh, you know, being accepting of one another. Like, why are we oppressing each other when we're, why are we, we're oppressed, but why are we oppressing each other? Um, so I wanted to point that out. It's something I'm probably gonna do with AWN in the future, <laughs> I, I will. Um, and also research suggests like autistics are more likely to be trans, non-binary, et cetera, and are more likely to struggle with gender dysphoria. Thanks, Kayla. Could you take us to the next slide? Of course. So now I wanna talk about, um, and so for the, re the remainder of, of this portion where we're talking about intersection HIV, I'll be sharing and then Eddie um, will be sharing some things too um, to kind of build on what we're talking about. And so any, in, in presentations like this, this is sometimes where people's eyes glaze over. Oh, we're talking about pride, we're not talking about HIV. Da, 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 da. And, um, um, and I think people don't understand the correlation. Um, so for example, people with disabilities in general, you know, I can sp give specific statistics related to autism or neurodivergence, but I'm going to just talk about disability overall, um, are at, um, you know, have a um, higher rate of potentially contracting HIV because um, there's a lot of lack of access of comprehensive um, sexual health education. Um, and there are, there's, a, there's higher rates of sexual assault. Um, there's higher rates of poverty where a person may have to engage in transactional and or survival sex and may not have um, the ability to negotiate um, condom or usage. Um, there's also a lot of lack of access to information because people infantilize disability. They think that, and again, a, a person can be asexual or aromantic or what have you, or gray ace, um, but at, you know, it's important. HIV should be integrated into general health screenings and it shouldn't be this afterthought or this um, you know, opt-in type of thing, like it often is treated in a way. And so because people aren't screened, aren't tested, they don't have information about adequate um, information or services. A lot of people might have outdated um, information that's from the 80s that they you know, have very inaccurate information about a HIV transmission and about living with HIV in general. Um, there are a lot of service providers. So when a person who's disabled, often you might, you know, to get a lot of services or resources, you might be engaging with various different medical providers or social workers or, or staff. And, um, it, there's already ableism that you're facing and possibly some of the other isms that we, we talked about. Um, HIV is one of the few things that people are still not comfortable, you know, are, that people, people are a lot of things that people, we have a lot of frontiers that people are no longer able to openly um, say cruel things about race or about gender or, you know, and, and then in the past they could, you know, movies and television shows, it was common. Um, now people may think them, but they're not as easily able to say them without you know, without ramifications. People can, still can do that with HIV and still do. Um, on dating apps, people talking about they're clean and so forth, as if people who have HIV are dirty, it's a serial status. And then when you flip to the other side, people living with HIV um, um, themselves, although HIV has, there's been a lot of advancements through the years. And many people describe now HIV as a, a, a chronic um, condition, you know, as opposed to a death sentence as it was seen in, in the past. And HIV, um, you know, indeed, there are many people who are, we have a lot of um, different medication regimens and people are a lot more likely to have a viral load that is undetectable. And when that is the case, you cannot transmit HIV to anyone because it's, there's such a, a small amount in your body. But HIV is constant inflammation. Um, so HIV and or, or the HIV med the medications impact um, the body in a lot of ways that can result in disability. Um, there are neurocognitive impairments that are common. There are problems with joints or joints, um, um, cardiology, um, gastrointestinal um, things. Um, there's certain types of mental health um, conditions and so forth, neuropathy, um, various different things that you find if, in a person who is quote unquote otherwise healthy. Um, and then um, often um, people living with HIV tend to, there's a disproportionate burden of HIV 
in a lot of communities that are already multiply marginalized. So um, they, if a person is trans, the likelihood of, of HIV is a lot higher. Um, if a person is queer, same um, gender loving, if a person is, you know, it's of color and then neurodivergence also is in there as well. Um, so that's one thing. Um, next slide, please. And so it all depends on the perception what, of what one sees. If you look at things from, from, you know, I guess from one view or the surface, it may appear that this is a non-issue. It's not something worth talking about. Um, but look beyond and think more deeply because a lot of, there is a lot of co-occurring mental health um, and substance use in HIV. And a lot of people are self-medicating and that is how um, they contract HIV in the first place. That has a lot, a lot of people self-medicate to deal with neurodivergence. Um, though we have medication and we've talked a lot about the, you know, vertical transmission and how um, prevention of, to mo of mother to child um, HIV transmission is so much lower now. It's, you know, practically non-existent now statistically. Um, there is still a higher likelihood of one's child, one's HIV negative child, um, having um, higher rates of developmental disabilities um, and, uh, and, you know, specifically certain neurodivergences. There's also some um, research that's emerging um, in Canada and some other places about the increased likelihood of people who have certain, um, certain neurodivergences, sensory disorders, autism, and HIV acquisition. If you have sensory sensitivity, are you really gonna wanna put lube on? Are you really going to use certain condoms? Are you really going to do certain things? Or, you know, or is this going to work? Or again, if you're in a circumstance where you um, are dependent upon someone, one in every four um, women, cis and trans living with um, HIV and AIDS, right. it has been a victim of intimate partner violence. That's 25%, that's known. So are you in a position where you can, you know, uh, where if your partner may be seeing other people you know, that you can, again, negotiate condom use, that you can say no, that you can, or are you in a situation where your, um, you know, your interdependence makes things challenging for you? Then there's so much stigma. Um, th there's um, a lot of people whose sexual um, partners um, are in particular zip codes. So they are, you may not have a higher number of partners than another group, but if you tend, tend particularly in queer um, communities of color, the, zip codes tend to overlap in terms of people's sexual activity and sexual partners. So you've got a pool where there's a higher risk of HIV. And this is this pool of people where you're interacting and you're dating. And as a result, um, you have a higher likelihood of contracting HIV, having sex a few times than someone else who might have sex three or four times more frequently than you in another group. So all, these are all the things that people don't think about. They don't understand. Like there's, there's stigma on both sides. There are people who be like, well, I, I, you know, I might have HIV, but at least my mind's intact or whatever. And then there are people who be like, well, I have this, you know, it's like, there's really, there, there shouldn't, like we talked about the spectrum earlier, there shouldn't be this, this division or this gap. A lot of these same exact people that we're talking about, these communities mirror one another so closely. If you look at one another, there is a lot of underdiagnosis of a lot of conditions, um, lack of access to resources, a lot of stigma, a lot of isms, a lot of premature death that can be prevented. And ultimately, uh, what we need to do is have trauma-informed and comprehensive care that um, that. Um, addresses the whole, the totality of a person and of a community. Um, so it, it's, you know, in terms of gender inclusivity, in terms of not, you, not um, stigmatizing HIV. There used to be a, an ad from a very prominent autism organization several years ago saying, you know, um, autism, you know, kills or, or, you know, or affects more people than cancer um, and pediatric AIDS combined. You know, so what is this fear mongering and this, you know, you know, the way that even the terms that people use, such and such as infected with HIV, it's a stigmatizing term. Infected, you know, if you Google the word infection, do an image search and take a look at what you see, um, what you see there isn't, uh, isn't affirming. So just like we talked about terms like high functioning and low functioning um, are, or severe and mild are belittling. People with HIV are living with HIV. And, you know, in addition to these other identities that they are very likely to have, that's where it's important to have leadership of the most impacted. Um, that's where it's important to have the voices of the people in charge so that they can inform practices, research, 
education um, so that we can be more equitable. There shouldn't, you know, we, we don't want to discriminate against sterile status or anything else, not just because there are members of our society who fall into those groups, but just because that's just the right thing to do. And so um, Eddie will continue. So we'll need to go to the next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to talk about the many intersections of HIV. One of the things that we heard, I would say, in the mid night in like 1990-95, after certain um, celebrities in the 90s, um, iconic celebrities uh, came out that they had been exposed to the HIV virus. And it's so interesting is that they didn't say that they were infected. If you go back and watch their tapes, they said that they had either acquired or contracted, but they didn't say. So the terminology, as Marina K was saying earlier, it is so interesting how these terms get uh, flung around based on your social economic um, background and race and what people perceive you to be. And with that is where I'll start. So although there are many intersections of HIV, especially when we're talking about a spectrum of autism, I want to share a non, what we call, and I put this in quote, non neuro. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm getting at when I say this, these terminology can get tricky, but I will use three examples in this many intersections. And I'm gonna use the three that are so obvious. And one will deal with race. The other one will deal with what we call autism. And the third one will deal with HIV. Now, the interesting thing about this is in HIV, we have people who actually acquire the, the virus, completely control it, give no transmission. Then you have someone who's HIV who fighting for their lives from what we call having the acquired immune deficiency where their T cells are at 200. That's one piece. The other piece is race. It's no secret that black and brown people fare far less better in autism and in HIV. Education, treatment, and understanding of their needs as a special population. And the last thing that is so interesting that I find, and, and, and maybe I'll tweak this a little bit. I should really put social economics in there. That really should be the second one. Because social economics really plays a big part of who gets what, who get access. You have black and brown people. Oh my who, gosh, Eddie, I got to jump in. <laughs> I'm so what? sorry. You are so right because we look at the fact that um, black and brown people are less likely to be diagnosed with autism or other conditions for them. If we're looking at ADHD and a number of other things, they're diagnosed later. They're misdiagnosed a lot. Um, with things like emotional disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, um, less likely to have uh, equitable services. It's the same thing we see in black and brown communities of people getting diagnosed much later, um, you know, when they're much sicker and um, just kind of like the lack of, of, of uh, you know, the disparities in the understanding that mirror the, the two, who can, you know, who, you know, who has access to, you know, being able to be diagnosed, who has access to information to be able to adequately um, treat um, oneself and, and, and be in the best health you know, holistically. So I'm sorry, I just had to come jump in. No, no, and you're right, because that, that all really has a part to do with um, uh, social, uh, that has a lot to do with the economics part of it. It, it really does. Uh, but even with that, we find that black and brown people did still lag behind uh, the, the, the rest of the population. So here we have the really, the intersection of HIV and neurocognitive is number one, every organism, if you will, tries to survive. It does so by endurance, resilience. And when we talk about humans, the attitude you take. And I'll start with the attitude 
first. One thing people who dealt with HIV, no matter where you are on the spectrum in any other of these categories, if you will, or sectors of life, or your social economic, or your race, is going to be your attitude. Sometimes we look at things as a blessing, and sometimes we look at them as a curse. I think it was this Natalie Cole, if anybody can remember that name, said, when you go through something, you have an option to come through bitter or better. We do that first with our attitude and then resilient. Now, resilience is very important because when you have your Damien, your Kayla, your Marina K, your Eddie, what we have realized, and I think I can safely say this, is that once we get knocked down, we get right back up again. That is self-awareness. That is resilient. That is saying there is nothing really wrong with me. The issue is you don't understand. I'm coming into an understanding. And it's so interesting that this group particularly represents the dichotomy of really what's going on and what we call mainstream. And then we have the endurance. The endurance. This month is a plethora of days that we're devoting to HIV, um, HIV testing, HIV, uh, uh, what's the other one? Um, national long, yeah, no, national, national yes, long-term yeah. survivors awareness day. Long-term survival, yes. which is actually on June 5th, which has passed. What's so interesting is the endurance um, medication. And let's equal and partner these up. Medication. And then let's say that I can't stand noises. So now I have two special needs that I have to navigate. And I have to have the endurance to do that. I have to endure someone else's foolishness for me to survive for something I basically have no control over. And I only wish that in these many intersections of HIV and particularly autism, which I think is, I totally agree with Damien, is that we just need way more studies. We just don't have enough studies on this particular sector. But I promise you, as soon as someone figure out how they can help a whole lot of other people by using us, they'll figure it out. <laughs> they'll come up with them. Cough, but, cough, COVID-19, monoclonal antibodies. Yeah, cough, cough, yeah, yeah, cough, yeah, cough. yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think we're just speaking truth here. And that is that it takes all of these survivor, endurance, resilience, and attitude. I only wish that people who are not as iconic when they're forced to tell their truth, but people who can be related to by everyday ordinary people. Yes. Can I, cut in, I just love what you're saying. Like, I think like you were talking about in the nineties when there were people who were coming out as being HIV positive. And then like we look at today, people, you know, like recently there's, you know, the, you know, there was a, a pretty prominent case and same thing with autism when people were opening up and saying, it shouldn't be that, oh, this celebrity or this person has this. Cause there's a million regular everyday people with these same diagnoses exactly. who matter who are important and who are living their lives, you know, boldly and bravely. And, you know, I just really love what you said about the attitude, you know, the Denver principles have been so, you know, have been a rallying cry um, and really the, the act up and a lot of the HIV activists of whom there were a number of people of color and queer people and neurodivergent people in those groups, of course, um, even if it's not always seen that way uh, when people look at the images in the past, but these are groups that said, no, we define who we are. We call ourselves people with AIDS. We are not patients. We do not have pity. We are not dying. People you know, spoke for themselves and wanted to be able to, to drive and direct their own services, their own programs. That's where we got MEPA and GIPA, Meaningful Involvement of People Living with HIV and AIDS, Greater Involvement of People Living with HIV and AIDS. It's where we got a lot of the, the, the revolutionary um, fast track and community advisory board and, and kind of peer researcher models that other conditions have today. 
HIV community has really done, has, hasn't controlled that. And that's what we're trying to see here in the autistic community, getting rid of stigmatizing terms, letting us have more, you know, allowing us, because it's our table, <laughs> to set the, 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 the you know, places at the table and to determine the meal and so forth. And so I'm sorry for cutting in. It's just, you're, you're just, you're, you're saying- No, that's okay. I'm glad. Golden stuff. I'm glad you, you are, uh, because it makes me feel like, well, I'm not just the only one that sees this. Um, and and sometimes it's so much inside of me that's wanting to say this from uh, from actually uh, uh, watching from the late 80s, from the middle of the 80s and the late 80s of this happening from the ground floor up. Uh, I've marched and act up. Uh, I've participated in those things. I've stood in fact in front of uh, uh, the uh, Capitol in, in in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, to 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 say you guys in 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 in, in Congress need to be doing something. Uh, you're so right, Marina Kay. There were quite a bit of Afro Americans and uh, Latinos who was in that fight as well. And it's the irony is is on the back end of it. They're not getting anything. You know, I, I made a, a, a statement once that got me in a lot of trouble at a, at a prestigious place when I said that I felt like uh, people were at the back of the bus at the beginning of this pandemic and at the end of it where we're now talking about cure and we have these treatments that can give people 30, 40, and 50 years of life. Uh, it seems like black and brown people are still at the back of the bus. And, and I just don't want to see- autism community too, unfortunately. That's you know, what I like, don't want to see. And, yeah. and I'm seeing it and I don't want to see that. I'm seeing it, but I don't want to see it. But unfortunately, the, the people that are marginalized, the group that are pushed aside, the, the, the group that, doesn't seem to have a voice, usually end up always fighting so hard through just pure survival, endurance, resilience, and attitude, end up setting up models for the greater population to survive. Exactly. And, and I think it's high time that uh, our voices be heard. And not by not because some famous actress or some famous r and stars, some famous pop star has come clean that they have this, but the very fact that human beings who have less resources have put power to words and said, no more, you will hear me. And Absolutely. so that, that's, my, my, that's, that's my spiel. Thank you. Oh, Next thank slide, you. please. Yes, so we're, um, I'm just gonna wrap up. Um, Kayla is gonna take the latter part of this, this slide. I just wanted to kind of, um, to kind of um, close up what um, Eddie and I were talking about. So we talked about all of these different intersections. And so um, bringing these all together, there's been um, a lot of research um, so in the HIV community, we have what we call um, greater participatory practices, which are research practices, which are um, recommended for um, people for, you know, basically um, stakeholder um, informed and respectful care. We have um, resources, um, we've developed resources about um, communication, communicating respectfully with others, um, meaningful um, community leadership and involvement and engagement. And then we've started, to, we have look, we've looked at models such as wraparound and holistic care. So we have models such as the Ryan White um, Care Act. So there's programs such as Ryan White Part C and D. Um, C is for um, at risk and youth and part D is for um, several different families. So women, infants, children, youth, adolescents, um, you know, um, caregivers and um, offering services, you know, from that, because again, if a person if we're wanting to treat one aspect of a person, you still need to address the other aspects, housing, mental health, um, and all of these other issues. So kind of like the medical home or medical care model uh, where it's a, where comprehensive services are wrapped into one where they're not just addressing the medical, but they're addressing um, the mental health and they're addressing, addressing psychosocial and you know needs and resources. Um, there's also um, some promising models out of the University of California, San Francisco and some other places about a lot of trauma-informed care. And there's some promising models from the um, uh, 
um, the, um, the greater people living with HIV caucus of how to evaluate and assess organizations, groups, teams, and even one's individual for, are you truly um, meaningfully including the community or is it tokenism? So all of these things are important um, aspects of health because health is not just, um, you know, something, it's, it's more than just physical. It's all about who, who we are. And so um, in terms of autism and, and all of these, these other aspects, um, Kayla's gonna share some other suggestions that are helpful, some, have, some of which have promising practices already in research, and some of which are things that the community has been, um, you know, championing and wanting to see more of. Yeah. Yeah, can, can I just jump in real quick, uh, Kayla, before you do, is I think the word that we all can agree on is that it is more than just biomedical. Mm -hmm. You know, agree. it's more than just coming up with a pill to try to give us a pill to say, okay, you're going to be all right. So I, I, I want to throw that in, yes. I relate to that. Thank you, Eddie. Um, this is Kayla. Um, so basically the suggestions we have for better health care in the future is to recognize relationship coaching or sexual health education as a benefits eligible health care service. Trauma-informed comprehensive sexual health education, including highlight diversity in all senses. And parenting and reproductive health education with neurodivergent considerations in mind. And there's many more. If y'all have any other ideas, just let us know. Okay, so finally, we're gonna, we, we have, there's, there's resources, we have resources. Um, we have the Autistic Self-Advocacy Atlanta, which is an affiliate, affiliate group of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network in, in Georgia. Um, it promotes autism acceptance and growth. I'm tr they're trying to figure out what to do right now, but um, they still host socials if you want to go. There's the Emory Bicori Young Women on the Autism Spectrum Group, which I co-created with someone with Susan Brasher from Emory, it's specifically for women on the autism spectrum and trans women, including trans women. And it's twice a month on Zoom. Hopefully, they'll meet up again soon. Um, there's also the sis there's Sister Love, which is a culturally competent reproductive justice and HIV services. I think there's one in Atlanta. Um, yes, they're in Atlanta and in South Africa. Um, the, um, their founder is um, Dr. Um, Dezan Dixon Jallo. And so they are, um, you know, they have a number of, in addition to um, reproductive justice and research services and advocacy and training that they offer. Um, and, you know, and they are, you know, um, gender inclusive as well. Um, yeah. of, again, um, being primarily led by um, people of color and, you know, by um, people who are queer and gender nonconforming. Oh, thank you, Marina Kay. And there's also in Atlanta, uh, Southern Fried Queer Pride, um, which is an art profit for queer, black, POC, people of color liberation. I personally know Taylor Alexander and Avery, who are the heads of Southern Fried Queer Pride in one of my first panels I ever did. There was an ableism in the queer community panel, and they also are. I also did something recently with them with my friend Angie about how they're making their their Southern Fried Queer Pride Festival more accessible. So hopefully that'll be taken into effect when the festival happens later this month. There is Gender Infinity, which promotes justice, equity, and hope for infinite infinite gender possibilities, and these generations, which is a health it that be the generations HBCU, which is historically black colleges and universities, Southern and tribal nations initiatives. And then this is just like for the US South, you know, Atlanta, Tennessee, Texas. Um, for general, not location specific, there is Barry Lee, who is, a, who is a, who, um, a man with, he was a disabled man. He hosts the Right Podcast, which is about disability and sexuality. Um, it's on Spotify. There is Elevis Training, a maze, org and the National Council for Independent Living YouTube, which has videos and about disability and sexuality. Um, there's the Hickey dating app, which is for specifically for autistic people. I mean, I'm on it, but it's kind of it kind of needs some work in my opinion. They can't keep showing people like thousands of miles away, you know. But you know, maybe it'll get better. So there, it's there. Um, ASAN, which you know, we're kind of like a little mad have got, has gone into some controversy lately and rightfully so. Um, they, but they did develop a really good um, content PDF about real talk, improving quality of sexual health care for patients with disabilities, which I 
is great. And last one, the, the autistic women with non-binary network, you know, AWN, they created last year a PDF of before you know your rights for trans healthcare. So if you're trans, I really recommend, and trans and autistic, I really recommend you go see that. That's a good one. In addition to those resources, we encourage you to look at, at these resources for inclusive community engagement, communication, and gender inclusive practices for practitioners and researchers related to HIV. And with that, we come to the end of our presentation. Um, if you want our contact, um, the, our emails and websites are here on this slide. Um, thank you everyone for uh, having us. Thank you Marina Kay, Damon, and Eddie for joining me on this. And uh, yeah, let's get into the Q&A.